everybody! So today I'm going to be showing you guys what I picked up at the comic book shop. I have a bunch of subscriptions there and the way it- for those of you who don't buy comics the way it works is you can subscribe to a comic and then whenever it comes out they put it in your subscription box and then I can just go to the comic book shop and pick up my subs. Which is helpful like for ongoing series so you don't have to worry about like getting to the comic book shop on time and hoping that there's an extra copy there. You can just ask your comic book shop to add it to your subscriptions and then they'll order a copy for you and then you get it uh, a copy of that comic before it goes on the shelf for the regular non-subscriber comic book visiting type people. So let's just let's just get into the comic. Um, a series that I really like is, that is one of like very few superhero comics that I read is Hawkeye. And the way Hawkeye works is you have two different Hawkeyes. You have Clint Barton who is boy Hawkeye and then you have Kate Bishop who is girl Hawkeye. And about I'd say like six-ish issues ago? Four to six issues, give or take, ago, Kate left New York to go vi live in LA. So the, the story has split off since then, and so you've got two different stories where you've got Kate trying to make it as her own superhero in LA against this woman named Madame Mask, who seems to be like screwing her up at every turn, and then you have Clint in New York who's like trying to get over being a powerless superhero in a world where you know, there's Captain America and Thor and Iron Man that are physically more than human, but this series makes it pretty clear that, like, Clint isn't lucky. If anything, the Hawkeye title brings a special level of unluck. Not really bad luck, just no luck for the Hawkeyes. The Clint Hawkeye has a very cinematic feel to its colors and its art style, and Kate's- the color schemes are a little bit brighter because she's in LA versus New York, but her artists, their expressions are- are great. Like, she makes a lot of really great faces. I love the art in this. For issue 17 of Clint Hawkeye, I was kind of irritated because this is a Christmas special in March about dogs. It's it's about a dog learning how to cooperate with his other doggy friends as they try to save Christmas. And his other doggy friends, known as the Winter Friends, are special dogs with superpowers. And this ordinary dog is trying to do it all by himself. And by the end of the Christmas special, spoilers, he learns how to cooperate with other people. The last issue of Clint Hawkeye was very dramatic. Some really crazy things happened that really fucked Clint up like hardcore. So I was really looking forward to continuing that story and instead um, I got a Christmas special in March about dogs. It was very well drawn and the metaphor of the dog being Clint was not ham-fisted and It was a cute story that I would have liked in Christmas, but this issue had the unfortunate luck of being a filler. It was a filler issue, and I don't like filler issues. They upset me and they irritate me as a fan, but as an artist, I understand that sometimes these things take time. That doesn't mean that I am not. I'm just really excited. I just just really, I'm just, I'm worried. I'm worried about Clint. Like, I know it's a superhero comic and they say that, like, everything's gonna turn out okay because, like, superhero comics go on forever, but I, I just, it's like the only superhero title that I read. I used to read Young Avengers, but now I read Hawkeye and, like, I care. I care about these guys. I want these little babies to turn out okay. There's a couple of Hawkeye trade paperbacks if you want to buy a collected volume and sample it. So anyway, it was a, it was a good issue. It was an okay issue featuring dogs. So like, let's move on. Another title that I got that I've been subscribed to for a while is uh, Fables. Fables is one of my favorite comic series, but this issue, issue 139, is it's supposed to be the mark of the end. There's going to be two issues for this tiny arc called The Boys in the Band, and it's about uh, Boy Blue's former band going back to the homeland to try and take their land back from the people who are occupying it after the adversary had been taken down. And I know that's a lot of words, but this is issue 139 of what's going to be a 150 issue run series. Fables is going to end with issue 150. And this is supposed to be a setup for it, but with the amount of storylines we have going right now that haven't really been addressed in a while, um, bringing in a new plot like this um, makes me really hesitant. Fables has covered a lot of ground. In the 139 issues so far, 
Fables has covered a lot of ground as far as characters and stories. We've gotten backstories from pretty much almost everybody, I guess. And Fables even has its own spin-off. Two spin-off series, Jack and, Fa and his Fables and then The Fairest, which was okay. I read, this, I read some of the second volume and I, uh, it seems nice, but the last, I'd say the last 30 issues of Fables have been kind of... Yeah, like they're okay, like they're good for my fable fix. What happens to Big B in it and where he is and like what happened with Boy Blue at issue 134 and the marriage between like Geppetto and the Blue Fairy and then like what's going on with Ambrose and his kingdom and there's just there's a lot of stuff going on in fables right now and there's not a lot there hasn't been a ton of closure about it. Boys in the Band I guess is supposed to finally do that final push for the Fables series to do what it needs to do for the end of the story. This particular issue, however, like I don't care about anybody that's in it, personally. Like there's Briar Roses in it, and she's been kind of important in the past in uh, taking down the adversary and like these really big Fables missions to protect the community, but I don't want B Boy Blue's band. I want, I want, I want Boy Blue back. But that's not gonna happen, so. I get two issues of filler and then more story involving Snow and Red. Before this series and what Boys in the Band is supposed to set up for the end of Fables is what I'm predicting to be the war between Rose Red and Snow White. Like they're gonna fight and it's gonna be intense and then um, I'm predicting the adversary is gonna come back and be like, hey guys, so like, fuck you. And then they're gonna be like, oh, we should totally work it out and be sisters again. Okay, let's fight against the adversary. And then they're like, oh no, Fable Town's totally destroyed. Let's go back to the homelands. And they're like, oh wait, this is gonna be complicated forever because we're immortal beings. Most of Fables has been collected in trade volume. If you want to start reading it, um, in about nine months, it's gonna be completely done. So go for it. Next up is um, issue 19 of Manhattan Project. This series, it is bananas. Um, the Manhattan Projects are what would happen if the US and Russia teamed up in secret during World War II. And it's about what happens to unchecked human ambition. It's very science fiction. This particular issue, we are spending a lot of time in Oppenheimer's head and watching the battle between himself and his, and the people he's consumed. With Oppenheimer, he consumes people and then makes their consciousness a part of him. And finally, like, they're starting to fight back because it's, you know, it's not awesome living on somebody else's head. So the comic features a lot of historical people, including like Joseph Oppenheimer, Einstein, Richard Feynman, people who have existed in history during this war um, have kind of all teamed up to explore dimensions and the universe and create war and go for power and stuff. It's a really big story and I, I really like it because the science fiction element is really cool. Their use of color is fantastic. Whenever we go into Oppenheimer's head they use their colors to kind of show you like which side they're on. It goes from like being the red and the blue to like showing either past stories or just using it as a method of storytelling to like regular colors and like actual present day story happenings. So, more red. So, if you're into science fiction and like dimensions and aliens and stuff, I totally recommend it. It's very good and it's very gruesome. It's very violent, but in like a really, if you're into that kind of way. My biggest critique of the Manhattan Projects is that of this cast of characters, none of them are women. Literally none of these people are women. And you could argue that in that historical context that there were no women working. But then I would say that you're full of shit. And if the most unbelievable thing you can come up with is that in in this world where we are crossing dimensions and a man is consuming consciousness physically and the most unbelievable part of all that is that a woman is a major player you need to look at your priorities i'm not gonna lie like good thing they have these names at the back of every issue because i definitely got confused between some of these white dudes between this white guy who really likes war and this white guy who really likes war like they're all cool characters i just it's just a lot of white dudes and you know I, I read a lot of comics about a lot of white dudes white dude white dude more white dudes a really white dude i stop a little guys you have aliens put a woman in there it's not too much ass so another series that I'm subscribed to that I really enjoy is a series called Alex and Ada. He's a human, she's a robot. In this particular world, androids are kind of the norm. People have androids, they help them with their housework, they, you know, 
do things together. In this world, artificial intelligence works. They've created it almost indistinguishable from humans, and that's a problem. Um, there was an accident that happened where a robot fought back for their life, and they killed a human. Ever since then, they haven't allowed androids to fully realize their sentience. And in some of these issues, they explain that, like, the sentience is there. It's just locked away. Because you don't spend, like, millions and maybe billions of dollars trying to develop a technology that you just throw out when the government says like, hey, no more. So the way it works, because of, you know, plot reasons, if they were to try and remove the sentience, the, ro the android would stop working. With this character, Alex, he, his grandmother gets him this android named Ada, and, you know, he's fine, he's a little awkward around her because he doesn't know really how to act around this person who is a non-person. He wants more from her, like, not just, like, to have sex consensually with her, kind of understand what it is about other people that he can't connect to. I really like stories involving robots robots and humans being friends or falling in love or having adventures together because I find that whenever you put a non-human next to a human who is still has the same emotional range as a person then you can kind of like you know compare humans to ourselves and like what makes us human and whether or not you know Ada should be considered a person because you know she can think and feel and she likes things and she dislikes things. This is issue five and she's just woken up. In the first issue they really start to lay the groundwork for Ada's awakening and the thing that are going to come after she wakes up. I am really excited to see where this series goes. I really like it. I, like I said, like I like robots and humans hanging out. I'm hoping it'll be one of my favorites by the time it's done. The art in it is pretty generic. It's not too out there or anything, but it gets the job done. It doesn't need to be super fancy to really tell its story or anything. It's written by uh, Jonathan Luna and Sarah Vaughn, and I have found that the Luna brothers are really good at tapping into uh, small things that make us really human. Uh, the stories I've read from the Luna Brothers so far I have really enjoyed, so if you think that you might be into robots and humans probably doing it, then I recommend this series. The last issue on my subscriptions that I picked up um, was Sandman Overture issue number two. Issue number one came out in October-ish, so we've been waiting like a crazy long time for this issue and like the art in it is fantastic. They, it's a little tough to read, but it's supposed to be a little convoluted because of the nature of the story that they're telling. In this, something has happened and all aspects of Sandman, of Dream, have gathered in the same place. In this issue, you find out it's because the universe is dying and it's Dream's fault. The bulk of this issue has to make sense of the fact that all of Dream exists in all of its form all at the same time. And it's really complicated for Dream to like try and wrap his brain around the idea that they are all the same person but they are all completely different so there is no us, there is only I, but they're all of different opinions but they all agree that they're different but the same and it kind of like whittles it, it takes them and it whittles them down to about to two to the Morpheus that we know and then the dream of cats and so they get to be buddies so dream gets them out this issue also makes a distinction between Morpheus and Daniel in this Daniel isn't featured as one of the aspects of dream implying that the Morpheus that we know is the last dream but the universe can't exist without a dream so I think it's starting to crumble at its edges as it tries to kind of wrap its mind around this thing that's happening that Dream fucked up. Thankfully it's 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 written by Neil Gaiman, so I'm not too worried about where the story is going to go. I know that Neil Gaiman has a history of treating his characters with a lot of respect. They don't get the ending you want, or even the ending that they deserve. They get the ending that's most appropriate. I really, really appreciate that Neil Gaiman doesn't patronize his readers with happy endings. So I don't know how this is going to end, but it's gonna be big and it's gonna be a lot of feelings. Um, the next issue of this is scheduled to come out in July, so if we're lucky we might get it before Christmas. That's all the comics I picked up this week. Um, I really do recommend all of them. So even though like issue 17 of Hawkeye was not what I expected and Fables is performing its swan song right now, I try not to pay for comics I think suck. I love comics. I love them. I love them so much. You can tell whatever story you want with comic books. You know, like with movies and TV shows, like there's a bit of a restriction there about, you know, worrying about your audience or the networks. With comic books, you can you can tell whatever story you want. You don't have to worry about patronizing children. You know, you can just write the story you want to tell. It's like my favorite thing about comics.
So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, if you have any questions about the comics uh, or anything that I said here, you can leave a comment. You know, like, favorite, subscribe, all that jazz. You know, I'm you've heard it like ten times today, I'm sure. I'll see you guys later.